Let's continue our bone discussion with the thoracic cage. When you think of the thoracic cage, think of your chest. That's what you're looking at. Think about these hard, strong bones in this region protecting vital organs. They're definitely helping to protect the lungs and the heart and any other softer tissue deep to it. They also form a semi-rigid chamber for ventilation. It's not fixed. It's not very hard and strong like, say, the walls of a bucket or anything like that because your ribs actually move. Look what happens when you take a very deep breath. You can tell the thoracic wall swings a little bit up and out. And then when you exhale, it does the opposite. <clears throat> it's because your ribs are not fixed back to your vertebrae. They swing up and down like the handles on a bucket. We'll see how that helps with ventilation in another video. But look at the different parts. Look at your ribs. 12 pair. So that's 24 ribs total. Now look at how they've been separated out into a few different categories. First, you've got the true ribs, also called the vertebrosternal. Now that's the first seven pairs starting at the top. So that's going to be 14 total pairs, one through seven. They're called the true ribs because they have a very strong hyaline cartilage connection to the sternum. Now inferior to those, <clears throat> you'll find the false ribs as pairs eight through 12. And within the false, there's two different types of ribs there. There are the vertebrochondral, that's pairs eight, nine, and 10. They have some cartilage connecting them to the sternum. And then the last two pair, 11 and 12, are called floating or vertebral ribs because they have no connection to the sternum. And that's why those are usually the ribs that are broken first. Looking at the sternum, it's got three main sections, manubrium, body, and xiphoid process. But we'll look at some other structures right along with it. And notice how the body of the sternum is also sometimes called the gladiolus, a little extra nickname for it. But we mentioned the ribs before in the previous picture, and of course you can see them down the side of this skeleton, at least most of them. Some of the floating ribs at the bottom, I can see at least one pair, another pair is a little bit hidden, but we saw those in that previous PowerPoint. Now if you look right here at the very top, you have this jugular notch. That is that depression in between the clavicles, right at the very top of the sternum. Just inferior to it, you find the manubrium. That's that large superior piece at the top. And just inferior to it is the sternal angle. That's right there where that manubrium meets the body. And the body is the main part of any bone. So it's this long length part. <clears throat> then down here at the very bottom, you have this sharp point called the xiphoid process. Because of that little point, that's why when you give CPR, you're told to go to the sternum, then go up a little bit higher. <clears throat> that way, hopefully, you don't break that thing off and shove it into some softer, deeper organ. Not much to the anatomy of a rib. Over here on one end, we have the sternal end. So this is the part that will connect to hyaline cartilage and then to the sternum. You got the body, the main part of any bone or structure. Here's the angle, the part where it bends and turns. There's a tubercle, a little bump, and then on the end ahead with a neck, which is a constriction just there below it. Now let's go to the appendicular skeleton. <clears throat> Again, the appendicular skeleton includes your upper and lower limbs plus what's called the girdles, the bones that hold those upper and lower limbs to the axial division. So we'll look at the pectoral or shoulder girdle up high, then the pelvic down low. We'll look at the upper limbs, the lower limbs, and all the bones and structures inside. But going back up top to this pectoral girdle, here you've got the scapula and clavicle on each side. That's what makes up that pectoral girdle because that is what holds the upper limb to the axial division. So we'll see these structures listed here and more. Now here we're looking at the scapula, what you might call your shoulder blade. Right up here at the top, we see the acromion process. <clears throat> now that acromion process is the very outside of your shoulder. If you put your hand on the very outside of your shoulder up there at the top, that's that process right there. Up here at the very top, there's a superior angle. Again, you got a bend and a turn. And then there's this other process, which is opposite of that acromion, the coracoid process. You can see it over here in this other picture also. There's a superior border. That's just this ridge right across the top. And just in front of it is the scapular notch, a little depression. Here we have the supraspinous fossa. Remember, fossa is a depression. That's just above the spine where it gets its name. And the spine shown here is what attaches the acromion process to the body of that bone. 
Over here we have the subscapular fossa, another depression. And if you look at this little flat piece right in here, this is where the head of the humerus fits into this bone. Now that little depression is called the glenoid cavity or glenoid fossa. Just above it, there's a tubercle called the supraglenoid tubercle. And just below it <clears throat> is an infra glenoid tubercle. Over here at the side is the infraspinous fossa that's below the spine, another little fossa depression. And then here's a lateral border to the outside and a medial border to the inside and then the inferior angle right down at the bottom. Right after that's our clavicle or collarbone, not much to it. We can see on one side is the acromial end. Now that's the end comes out here and touches that acromion process of the scapula. Body is the main part of any structure, and then here's the end closest to your sternum, that sternal or medial end, where the acromial is the outside lateral end. Now let's look at your arm bone or your humerus. It's a big bone from your shoulder to elbow. So looking at this bone right here at the very top, there's a head. Right below it, you're going to see two different necks. One's the anatomical neck. Notice that little line or ridge right there. That is where that epiphyseal plate was found, where this long bone was getting longer when it was still growing. There's a couple of big bumps up here at the top close to that head too. The big one's the greater tubercle, the smaller is the lesser. Now inferior, should say a little bit more distal or further out, will be the surgical neck. Reason it has this name often that this bone is broken, that's usually where it gets broken at, and surgery is sometimes needed to fix any problems there. There's a little groove in between these tubercles called the intertubicular groove. Its name tells you just exactly what it is. And a little bit lower is the deltoid tuberosity. Now the deltoid tuberosity is a thick part of this bone in the body section. It's where the deltoid muscle attaches to it. And there's a little radial groove. It's very small and shallow, really can't be seen on this bone. Now that was back up here close to your shoulder. That was the proximal end at the top where that head is. That's what fits into that glenoid cavity of this scapula shown back there before. But now we're getting down to the bottom of this picture at the distal end. Seeing down here's close to your elbow. So before we get to the end, we run into a couple of ridges. There is a lateral and a medial supracondylar ridge. Again, to the outside and inside of that bone, there's a little ridge. Supracondylar means above that ridge. So that gives you their location and where they're at. Go down a little bit lower, closer to your elbow. <clears throat> there's a little shallow depression called the radial fossa. And then right beside it is the coronoid fossa. And if you look to the back, posterior side of this bone, there's a big deep one to the back called the olecranon fossa. That's what the olecranon process, which is the tip of your elbow, fits into. You can always tell when you're looking to the back side of this bone by that large fossa that's found there. Now, if you look down here, just before you get to the end of the bone, there's a lateral and medial epicondyle. Condyles are these little projections, epi. They're just before the end of the bone, and there's a lateral and a medial. Then you get down to the very end of the bone. Well, this is what you'd have at the very bottom of the elbow. You've got this trochlea to one side and then the capitulum. The capitulum's where the head of the radius will articulate. Your ulna articulates with this trochlea. And these two epicondyles, that's those big points. Feel down in your elbow with those knobs sticking out to the lateral and medial ends. That's what those epicondyles are. Now getting down in your forearm, we're going to look at the radius and the ulna. So here's the radius, not much to it. There's a head and a neck, as we've seen before. A little radial tuberosity. Now again, at the top of this picture, that's the proximal end of that bone close to your elbow. Down here at the bottom is close to your wrist. And there's a little sharp point down there at the bottom called the styloid process. But right alongside of that radius is the ulna. These two bones are side by side in your forearm. Up here at the top is the olecranon process. That's the tip of your elbow right there. There's a trochlear notch, which is where the trochlea, part of the humerus, fits into. And then here's the coronoid process, a little bump below it. Just below that there is the ulnar tuberosity. Down here towards the bottom, you've got a head. You've got a little ulnar notch just to the inside of this styloid process down there at the bottom. Also, we've got the wrist and hand. In your wrist, there are eight carpal bones. We're going to look at those eight. And then in your hand, there's the five metacarpals. Now, if we look at this right here, 
you can see up here at the top are the eight carpals in your wrist. There are the five metacarpals make up the palm of your hand. And then here's your digits with the individual phalanx bones. That's your fingers right there. Well, looking over here to the side, you can see that these carpals are found in two different rows. There's a proximal and a distal row. Well, look at the proximal row. Start over here closest to the thumb. There's the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, and then pisiform bone. And then there's the distal row a little bit further out. Starts over here thumb side with the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. And if you look at these individual metacarpals that make up the palm of your hand, they're numbered one through five. Always start on the thumb side with one and count your way across. Same with your digits or fingers. And again, if you look in the digits or fingers, there's individual phalanx bones. There's a proximal, a distal, and a middle in between, and your thumb doesn't have the one in the middle. There's another view with the same stuff on it. 